What's up, people? What's up, people? What's up, people? It's your boy, MM2K of PNTS Network, MM2K Gaming, Hard Knock Digital Culture, Cloud Dosage, Broadband Bully, CGTV, you name it, I'm there. And I'm back again with another NRO Daily, and this one is a special one titled Xbox Admits Defeat. Can Xbox compete with PlayStation and Nintendo? Before we get into this one, I want to welcome you back to our channel. And on this channel, we discuss the latest and greatest in AAA gaming news. However, if, however, if you're new to this channel, can you do us a huge favor? Hit that like button, hit that subscribe button and rock those bells for notifications, please. So you know when we're dropping content like this. Now, today we're talking about Phil Spencer's kind of funny interview where he made some controversial comments regarding Xbox's ability to compete with PlayStation and Nintendo. We'll take a closer look at Phil's statements, discuss the articles that support or contradict his claims and examine Xbox's overall strategy. So let's get right into it. First and foremost, let's talk about the kind of controversial interview. Let's dive into what Phil Spencer said during this interview. He admitted that Xbox cannot compete with PlayStation and Nintendo in the console space. Now, as a matter of common sense, and I, and I wanna get to this first because I've seen a lot of hoopla out there on social media about quote unquote people not understanding what Phil said and taking it out of context. I, I think it. I think the problem is much deeper than that. All right. As a matter of common sense, we know the crux of Phil's argument was focused on the console market when he was talking about not being able to compete. We know that. However, I feel like brand loyalists and many Phil sympathizers are trying to gloss over certain spillage beyond consoles that he's implying here. All right. And first, I will show more concrete evidence of this later. This evidence includes proof Phil and Xbox definitively wanted and believed they could significantly shrink the console gap. They just failed in doing so and have become disillusioned at that goal now due to a big recent event. Also, Phil may be many things, but he is not dumb. He's very crafty with words and he knows how they land. He is the master, and I mean the absolute master of doublespeak. Now, I don't wanna sound like I'm better than anybody, and I'm not trying to be facetious here, but honestly, I've been working in the Fortune 500 world 25 plus years. I have experience managing managers in that realm, testifying in, in, in high, multi-million dollar cases, depositions, all that stuff, right? So I, I wanted to preface that before I say this. Maybe many of you were never responsible for holding, let's say a business town hall that was a, that was designed to address a critical event that required a powerful message behind it. You can kind of say that Phil going on kind of funny or you know keeping his appointment there because I, I believe it was scheduled prior to all this mess happening with Redfall and so forth. But him going on there, changing the message that he wanted to relay, it's kind of like a town hall where you got to address, address something critical with your staff. Well, he got to address something critical with his, with, with his um, consumer base, right? Maybe a lot of you that are saying that we are taking things out of context, we're not understanding Phil's message, maybe you don't have experience in that realm, right? Why do I say that? Because, well, let me just assure you, that even though you may not, I do, lucky for you, all right? Simply put, the mood, the answers to the questions, possible rebuttals, if not supplied in advance, were all rehearsed, okay? This wasn't, this wasn't something off the cuff at all. He knew exactly how his words, his words were land. He also knows how staunch his loyalists are out there and his sympathizers and trying to make what he said sound better than it actually did if the end result caused too much stir on social media. So simply put, if Phil wanted to say what we're not understanding, which is what you guys want us to derive from this, look, we want to deliver you the best games ever still, but we're just doing it through varied means, our way, a way that's different from Sony and Nintendo. He would have simply and most importantly, plainly said that. So yes, 
We get it. The crux of what he was saying was regarding console competitiveness. However, there's more than enough here that concludes based on Phil's understanding of perception and the precedent that he's served with his double speak. There's more than enough here to derive that the quality aspect of his comments were an indication to Xbox's approach across delivery systems. Now I will dive deeper in the core of the actual Xbox strategy later, but I wanted to make sure that it was abundantly clear. We're not stupid. We're not taking things out of context. I just think that a lot of the sympathizers and loyalists are not looking at things from 5,000 feet. All right. However, you know, for, for craps and giggles, let's play, let's play devil's advocate. Let's say that his reference to quality and competitiveness was solely based on consoles. Even so, we have some serious holes in his reasoning. For instance, and in referencing why they quote unquote can't compete, Phil cites the Xbox One generation of gaming as an example. He believes that gamers are loyal to their old library of digital content, which keeps them locked into the current console of choice. However, this theory was debunked by his predecessor, Don Matrick of all people, several years ago, based on data that he referenced. He showed us, you know what? Matter of fact, while I talk about what he showed us, let me show you this. He showed us that data that only five, he, or he referenced data that he had that only 5%, maybe less, of gamers buy new consoles to play old games. The article in reference is from Polygon. It says it's titled Backwards Compatibility is quote unquote backwards thinking, says Matri uh, Microsoft's Don Matrick. From the article, according to Matrick, only 5% of players use a new system to play games from a previous generation, which means that it didn't make sense for Microsoft to really go all in, particularly because at this time, they were focused on providing AAA genre defining content. Why? Because they were trying to beat Sony at that because Sony was becoming more and more successful at taking over the living room. Before the Satya Nadella era, that was Microsoft's biggest concern and why they even got into gaming was to stop Sony from taking over the living room instead of Microsoft and their suite of products doing so, right? So in order to do that, you got to beat Sony at its own game. You got to create better quality content, more genre defining co content. And that's something they were very successful with in the 360 generation. They wanted to carry that over to the Xbox one, but it didn't work as they anticipated. However, again, because your goal is new genre defining content and you're trying to outperform Sony in that arena, you're not that focused on older content, right? So with that being said, I will admit, this data provided by Don Matrick was at a time when digital content was less prevalent. However, many would argue it still heavily applies today. Why? Well, first let's talk about how this generation landed for both um, Xbox and PlayStation at launch. Xbox by many critics did a way better job of preservation, AKA backwards compatibility, right? Hey, even many critics those that are really critical of Xbox and known for it cite that uh, the Xbox Series S and X's biggest advantage over the PlayStation 5 is the backwards compatibility notion. All right. And they talk about that in this article. Let me show you this. This is from Game Ran, who is again oh, of the staunchest Xbox critics in the past few years. They got an article out to this is Xbox Series X's biggest advantage over PlayStation 5 is becoming clear. To quote this article, while there are new titles and exclusive games coming to both consoles, Xbox Series X has one serious advantage over the PlayStation 5. It continues between PlayStation and Xbox, the latter, which is Xbox, is the only one that really offers a fully fleshed out backwards compatibility system and they try to reason that by saying that Xbox has had this feature for more, uh, for much longer than PlayStation, right? Explaining why they feel that it, it's so much better. That being said, still, it's very clear that Xbox has the better backwards compatibility uh, setup, one that allows you to carry your digital content over from the next. So that should weigh heavily into, you know, 
its adaptation rate with this new console. They should be able to keep the people that they had and increase it a little bit more due to some other initiatives that they think is gonna shrink the gap. We'll get into that later. However, we see the opposite. What am I talking about? Let me show you this. This is an article that says PlayStation 5 versus Xbox Series X versus Switch launch sales. It's comparing the first six weeks since launch and PlayStation 5 is handily defeating Xbox Series X and S six months since launch, almost outperforming it two to one. It's just through the first six weeks available worldwide, the PlayStation 5 is ahead of the Xbox Series consoles by a fair margin. PlayStation 5 is ahead by 1.95 million units. All right, but hold on. How is that the case? People wanna play old games. They wanna keep up a digital library. And at that pace, within the first six weeks, I think that pace is worse than the Xbox One generation, if my numbers are correct, right? At least within the first six weeks. Things Numbers fluctuate, um, you know, a year or so after. However, again, the biggest thing that you had to offer over your competition was access to older games. Guess what? That access didn't grant you much of an advantage within the first six weeks. It also didn't grant you much an advantage at the six month point. This article reads, PlayStation 5 is estimated to have doubled Xbox Series X S sales during quarter one, 2021. It says PlayStation 5 reportedly outsold Xbox Series X and S by more than two to one during the first three months of 2021. So if you have a time frame where your backwards compatible games are going to be more key and more staunch for you when you're buying a new console, it's gonna be within that first six months, right? Right? So you would see, even though you sold less consoles and you had less saturation last gen, you're gonna, you know, see the levels that you had last gen on top of, you know, maybe picking some more people off because your competition doesn't have that much, you know, they don't have the preservation levels that you do, right? Well. Seems like that, that part of Phil's theory is somewhat flawed. That being said, let's continue on. In addition, when you go past just, you know, older, maybe one and done games or RPG games, you know what I'm saying, that people may want to replay, which again, Don Matrick has already proven to us, doesn't have the effect on new console purchasers, especially, you know, at launch. Um, in addition to that, the, the games that are uh, generation agnostic, all right? Games that I think Phil was trying to cite as well. Games like Fortnite, Destiny 2, heck, even Division 2. Those poke holes in his theory as well because those are also platform agnostic as well. They're cross-platform. They have cross-save. What do I mean? Well, if you go play Fortnite on one device, you maintain the same data if you go to another advice, device, right? Same with Destiny 2. Same with the majority of the, um, the generation agnostic games out there, right? Even Division 2, which isn't um, device agnostic or platform as platform agnostic as Destiny 2 and Fortnite, you can still jump from a PlayStation to an Xbox, Xbox to a PlayStation and maintain that data, right? So that pokes another hole in Phil's theory. But here's the worst thing. And ironically, it comes from Xbox itself when we're talking about Fortnite. Um, because of the whole um, iOS Epic Games debacle that landed those two entities in court, Apple and Epic, Fortnite is no longer available on iOS devices. As a remedy, at, at Epic, paired up with Xbox and xCloud, which is still available on iOS devices and allowed Fortnite to be playable there. Because that pairing was so strong, and again, because Fortnite is platform agnostic, and even though playing on xCloud isn't as good as playing natively on iOS, especially in a competitive battle royale shooter, Xbox saturation amongst the cloud competitive skyrocketed, right? You've seen it in documentation from CMA. 
It skyrocketed after Fortnite. As a matter of fact, I believe it was Sachi Nadella, correct me if I'm wrong, had quoted that, you know, after the 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 um, implementation of Fortnite on xCloud, you know, on iOS devices, that Xbox saw millions of new, never before Xbox gamers hit their ecosystem. So again, this whole... Oh, you know, once you pick a platform, you stick to it or, you know, you your mind is made up. All that is debunked. These, 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 uh, you know, it, it, people don't buy new platforms to play old games generally. And even the generation agnostic games, a lot of them have a, a crossover saves and all other stuff. It doesn't even matter. All right. But there's bigger contradictions. Let's get into them. Let's talk about Xbox's big contradictions. Now, according to articles from GameIndustry.biz, Eurogamer, The Gamer, uh, Kotaku, Icon, Era, etc., Phil Spencer has made other comments that do support some of his theories, but more often than not continue to contradict his statements. For example, in an interview with GameIndustry.biz a few years prior, Phil said that he believes, right? He said that he believes... Again, I'm not capping here. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I'm laughing. But now that the dust has settled, it's, it's, it's funny to hear. All right. But, it's, but, but Phil said that he believes that Game Pass is turning into a deciding factor and people choosing which console to buy. I swear to goodness, I'm not making this up. You don't believe me? Let me show you. Hold on. Give me one second. Check this out. This is the article in question. This is Xbox wants to release a game every three months. Now, this is uh, this is Xbox's Microsoft's attempt to go to uh, a publication and really promote its platform going into this generation. All the great stuff that they, we can expect. Uh, we got Tim Stewart contributing here, Dave McCarthy. You got even Satya Nadella out there. And then you got Phil Spencer saying this. Spencer said that Xbox believes it will increase its market share or console on console because it has both the lowest price next generation machine in the Xbox Series S and the most powerful console in the Xbox Series X. He also states that Game Pass, again, now you thought it was capping. Here it goes right here. Game Pass is turning into a deciding factor Actor and people choosing which console to buy. <laughs> okay. All right. So the ridiculousness of that is not the crux of why I showed you that. Why I showed you that is because it's very contradictory to what he said to kind of funny. What do I mean? Well, Phil says during the kind of funny interview that Xbox is not in the business of out consoling Sony or Nintendo. That suggests that they don't, that suggests that they like never saw a way to minimize the saturation gap. But in what we just read, they absolutely did see a way. And Phil is from the ilk where he knows that definitively, you know, trying to battle PlayStation and the AAA genre defining market is enough to flip how things are. But Microsoft, this current Microsoft, who's no longer worried about taking uh playstation taking over the living room they feel like the bigger battle is just saturation globally they don't want to do that why because it's too risk adverse and the juice is not worth to squeeze i'm going to show you what i'm talking about shortly however being competitive in this space was actually a goal and was important to them so when phil sits up there and says oh i see the comments out there and just people just think he makes it sound like we just made this up. But again, not too long ago, he was saying these things himself. So disingenuous. And like I said, in order to achieve that goal that they had prior as far as shrinking the, the, the console gap, it is reasonable to derive they'd rather focus on providing access to a pleasurable variety. What do I mean by that? I mean, think of a buffet to a Ruth Chris Steakhouse. Both places may serve steak, but you're going to get the best steak at Ruth Chris Steakhouse. You just got to pay out of top pocket for it. Top dollar. However, if you go to, let's say, Golden Corral to get it, you might get some tasty, some decent tasty steak, but you're going to get a variety of other things that you can try. Maybe you'll like it. Maybe you won't. 
maybe most of it is tasty or it was worth the effort and it won't break your pocket, AKA game pass, right? So in actuality, again, the assertion that Phil tried to make during that interview, there's no world where Starfield is an 11 out of 10 and people start selling their PlayStation 5s is disingenuous. He comes from the prior ilk during the uh, Steve Ballmer, Don Matrick era, where it was proven already, right? It was proven. Again, they just currently under Satya Nadella don't think the juice is worth the squeeze because there's a lot of risk incurred and your staff has to be modeled a certain way in order to achieve it. I'm gonna get into that shortly, just bear with me. You know what I'm saying? So again, they wanted they, they, they want to close that gap. They thought it was possible um, through Game Pass and through granting and, and, and increasing access. A again, Xbox just rather make inroads to shrink that gra gap, not increase it, excuse me, um, through Game Pass, a venue that takes a lot of loss lead in order to fulfill, a task only possible with a company that A, has Microsoft's already established gaming footprint, but more importantly B, Microsoft's war chest. <laughs> That's the strategy, folks. But it's problematic. And let's talk about that. The problem with the strategy. So what does this all mean for Xbox's strategy and core focus? Well, Xbox is focused on providing access to a pleasurable variety, while PlayStation is focused on maturation of AAA acclaimed content. Now, both PlayStation and Nintendo have shown that routine, critically acclaimed content is the most successful strategy with consumers. Microsoft and Xbox, under Satya Nadella, however, is more focused on financial gains and has designed a team to focus on delivering, again, pleasurable, plentiful content and hardware easy to mass produce and distribute however this strategy is unproven and requires a seismic shift in content availability and consumer habit now xbox's attempt at this seismic shift seems to be a failing proposal at the moment as regulators such as cma of uk and the ftc rejected the biggest uh, insertion of energy into this seismic shift that would have been possible to date, which is their purchase of Activision Blizzard King, the APK deal. Having things like Call of Duty and, and Overwatch and Diablo day and date in Game Pass would have really shifted the paradigm and, and made people really focused on this value narrative because you're getting games that normally top notch or you're getting that Ruth Chris Steakhouse steak at Golden Corral. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And only someone like Microsoft can loss lead like that, meaning they can endure the losses that they would occur by taking such high quality steak and selling it at a low price because eventually they'll make it up when everybody says, oh, in order to get this steak, I ain't got to go to Ruth Chris Steakout and pay $100, $200 anymore. I got to go and growl and, play, and pay $25 to get some of this steak. And I get an endless supply of buff, other buffet items, right? That would have completely shifted how, what makes, uh, what is the success with them gaming? And fortunately for us that focus on quality, because we don't want everything flowing through Microsoft because of various management problems. Why Phil had to come on kind of funny anyway because of how they managed Redfall and he admitted to a lot of that. Some of it he tried to throw uh, Arcade under the bus, but that's a whole nother uh, podcast. We, we don't want quality um, being gobbled up by Microsoft of all people. Really, we don't want consolidation at heavy levels anywhere. We want these uh, developers to be as independent as possible, but we definitely don't want the top games being gobbled up and bought by someone who can't even maintain the stuff that they have. They, they've been failing with the previously critically acclaimed content they have under their umbrella within this regime, right? So with that being said, the regulators said, uh-uh. And as a result, Xbox now wants to play the empathy card, play that game and claim that they're being hamstrung from providing the best experiences due to second party deals. And they're not allowed to be Microsoft or be Xbox. When in reality, the problem is that Microsoft at Microsoft rather 
their talent is groomed for mass absorption, delivery, and access, not quality. Quality is what consumers have been accustomed to, not access to quantity. Studies show that the average gamer only buys two games a year and only has about nine, maybe a little bit more games in their library during a whole generation, right? Xbox at this juncture readjusting for that current narrative says, nah, we don't want to do that. It's not worth it. Again, it doesn't provide enough juice for the squeeze. Why do I say that? Well, SEI Shuhei Yoshida perfectly illustrates why this is something that PlayStation is willing to do, but Microsoft under this current regime, Satya Nadella no longer worrying about PlayStation taking over the living room, but making the real battle about access globally, you know what I'm saying, via the cloud and subscriptions, why they don't even want to touch it. Let me show it to you now. Shuhei Yoshida says that only four out of 10 PlayStation games make money, but Sony will always support talent, right? Let me read you the critical parts of this article. It says, it's a hit driven business. We look at our financial results of the titles and probably three or four out of 10 make money and maybe one or two make all the money to cover the cost of the other titles. So we have to be able to maintain that hit ratio at a certain level to be able to continue in the business. So we always try to find out and support and help grow the talent. That's the most important work that I believe myself and some of my management team at the time at Worldwide Studios are doing. So in other words, Yoshida confirmed that Sony only sees success out of 30 to 40 percent of the exclusives they publish. Only 30 to 40 percent of them make money. And only 10 to 20 percent make enough money to rectify the losses incurred by the less successful titles. That is not worth the squeeze to Microsoft. They are in the mass production and mass distribution business. They don't want something that's only going to garner 30 to 40% success and just gaining revenue or 10 to 20% success and being a hit. That's not enough for them. They need to be able to mass produce something that is going to, I don't want to say incrementally, but it's going to be for sure a success with a lot less squeeze involved. And hence their strategy of co a complete seismic change in the industry. It's gonna cause some heartache at first, but in the long run, it's gonna make it easier for them and them only to do what needs to be done if gaming was changed in that arena, all right? So here's the conclusion. In conclusion, y'all, it's all about accountability as always. In conclusion, can Xbox compete with PlayStation and Nintendo? Well, Phil Spencer's comments suggest otherwise, but Xbox's overall strategy and focus may indicate the flaws in what Phil Spencer said during the interview. It's clear that Xbox is trying to shift the gaming sector upside down to gain an unfair advantage regarding access. However, it remains to be seen whether or not this strategy will work. As gamers, we should focus on the quality of the games we play, not just the quantity. And with that said, let's hope that Xbox or any gaming company prioritizes quality over access in the future. Again, Xbox may not think it's worth the squeeze, but guess what? I'm not part of Xbox's board. I don't get a check from them. If you have people like PlayStation, Nintendo, whoever, that want to take that risk and maintain the art and maintain it at the highest and purest quality so we get the best output, I'll take whatever juice <laughs> comes from their hefty squeeze possible and available. That's it from your boy. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more gaming news and updates. And if you did like what you had to hear here, check out the links below to follow me. They'll lead you to the Broadband Bullies, PNTS Network, Hard Knock Digital Culture, and yes, Cloud Dosage. With that said, appreciate all of y'all. Have a wonderful, wonderful gaming day. Peace.